comfortably zoned with the zigzag man in Alameda, California, pushing on the doors of life marked pull and fighting the unholy trinity as we go. Big business, organized religion, and government. We are back. A's baseball, past, present, and future. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. Nancy Finley isn't here, but Jerry Feidelberg is. How are you, Jerry? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day in the Bay Area, about 66 degrees. I just can't beat the weather. Oh, um, anywhere in the country has suffered more than Northern California. A few fires notwithstanding, but um, it's uh, it's crazy weather all over the country, and we are sure is. stabilized anywhere from 60 to uh, 75. Um, that's pretty much it day to day. It's... It's spring or it's fall. We don't get summers in Northern California, and we don't get winters, but we do get um, we do get spring and fall, and it's moderate, and uh, we both like it. Yeah, we really only have two seasons in in the Bay Area. One is baseball season, and the other season is everything else. Well, there's pocket pool season too. There's other sports <laughs> yeah, besides, right. ba- besides baseball, you know. Um, That's for sure. And had it not been an, um, disqualified as an Olympic event in 1946, um, I might be <laughs> in Athens tomorrow. There you in go. other words, uh, let's talk baseball and sure. more rambling about pocket pool. Um, <laughs> I have something to say. I think Art, I th- Art Fowler, I called him. Wow. Art Fowler. Remember him? Oh, you're going back. I am. But but the A's have another Fowler. And uh, right. I'm wondering if it's any sort of a relation, but uh, we'll find out about that another time. He's about to take over as the permanent leadoff man. And... Um, they're going to go with what they got because they're really not getting much from the Sonny Gray trade as expected. And um, Well, they have two players down in the minor leagues. I think Caprillion had uh, surgery and Tommy John surgery, and he's just coming back. And the right. other the other fellow is in the, in the minor leagues. I, I don't recall his name. But, uh, but, you know, Dustin Fowler is was one of the keys in the trade. Absolutely, and I think his time has come. He has the skills. He is fast as hell. He's got a good arm. He's good good in the field. And, um, hey, look, this team needs Pep at the start of the lineup. Um, I'll say that. Yeah, this team has, has got a Jekyll and Hyde personality. Uh, when When they're on their road, they're great. They can hit. They hit better on the road than they do at home. They got about uh, two and a half times as many home runs on the road, and they got a decent road record. I think they're just one game under 500 on the road. They're 15 and 16, and they're 15, uh, 16 and 15 at home. Some because they're 31 and 31. So they're not now, playing, playing badly. You would have road. taken 31 and 31 at the beginning of the year at this point. Oh yeah, absolutely. Everyone Me picked too. them for last I, place. Everyone picked them. I said they were going to finish two games over 500, 82 and 80 for the year. And everyone scoffed. But we'll see. We'll, we'll see, see for sure. Um, Megadin got hit last night, and that wasn't fun for me. No, it was his worst outing. Uh, he had a wonderful. He was four and zero in uh, May, and uh, he was just. He was just being knocked silly by the uh, Rangers hitting. I mean, Jerickson Propar had a career night last night, too. First multi-home home run game in his career uh, with two home runs, and then he had five runs batted in, which was also a career high. Right. So, I, uh, and, I watched and, Guzman, and game. Ronald Guzman took him deep, and big Joey Gallo took him deep. Those were the four home runs. So, 
and the, the range is just five about, the night before. We talk about yeah. great announcers, and Ken Korak is certainly one of them. Um, I want to give some credit to a guy who gets no publicity at all, and that's uh, Glenn Kuyper, Dwayne Kuyper's brother. And he is solid as a TV announcer. Yeah, Glenn's, Glenn's pretty good. Uh, I like the team. Uh, I especially like Ray Fossey as the analyst. Ray can tell you what's coming out of the pitcher's hand. He knows if it's a two-seam or split, four-seam or curveball changeup. He knows the speeds, and he, he's really there analyzing the game because he did it. You know, he's a great catcher, and uh, he, he's been doing this for a number of years. So it, it is a good team, and I like to hear them, both of them. Yeah, Glenn does not get the recognition that his brother does. You know, the, the, the Kruko and Kuiper team in uh, San Francisco uh, is, is always on the Hall of Fame ballot, I guess, for to make the broadcasters Hall of Fame. And Glenn, Glenn's not in that uh, recognition. And the A's also have another guy that gets absolutely no recognition, and most people don't know who he, who he is, and that's Vince Contronio, uh, that, who does yes. the broadcast with, with, uh, with Ken. They're a good team. Vince is very smooth. He gets it right, and he's a joy to listen to. One of one of the hallmarks of great broadcasting is to, to when they when you know a lot of the plays are repetitive, and a lot of a lot of things go on day in day out and become routine. And if these guys, if they, when I listen to these guys, it sounds like the first broadcast I've ever heard from them. It, it's fresh, and that's that's. Those, those are the marks. Uh, having that happen is a mark of a great broadcaster. Make it, making it entertaining, no matter yep. which team wins. That's, oh, that's yeah. the, the name of it. And it, both of them have a, a joy in their voices where they're, all four of them really enjoy what they do. Um, yeah, it's, it's tough when your club's getting beat 12 to 2. Yeah, you know, when it's a oh. lapper and it's the third inning, you got six innings to, of a lot of filler time to figure out how to how to make it entertaining, and that's that's the knack in broadcasting. That's where the skills come in. I have to say, the John Miller is across the bay is uh, absolutely a delight at that. No, Miller, Miller, Miller's in the Hall of Fame. Come on, he's, he's top of the line. Hall of Fame. Yeah. yeah, he's already there. He had uh, one thing he, about he broadcasters; they could still do their job and be in the Hall of Fame and have to accept all those accolades in every city that they go to. Um, oh yeah, well, well, Miller was great. You know, he grew up in Hayward, and he right. he did work for the he worked for the A's when he was breaking in. Uh, he, he broadcast for the Red Sox, he broadcast for the Orioles, and he did the Sunday night broadcast on ESPN. And uh, then he came to the Giants, and he, has, he his credentials are great. And one of the great things that uh, John Miller did, is, and everyone should hear this, he does his impression of Vince Scully broadcasting in Japanese. <laughs> I've heard that, yes. Absolutely, that's priceless. Uh, and his home his home run call is great too, and it's uh, when the ball goes flying out of the ballpark, he doesn't say it's out of here or bye bye baby or anything like that. He says adios pelota in Spanish. Adios ball. Yep, you got it. Uh, yeah, we're ble- we've been always blessed in the Bay Area with terrific announcers. You and I haven't talked about it. But we could probably, between us, come up with ten guys who were all-time great announcers. You know. St- yeah, well, you go King. back to Bill Bill King and Lon Simmons, and Lon Simmons had such a distinctive voice; it was unbelievable. One night, oh, we, my guys. wife and my wife and I and another couple were having dinner at a restaurant on. Uh, in Alameda called Enrico's out in, uh, on Bay Farm Island. Mm-hmm. And we're having dinner, and the voice, the people next to me, I didn't see who it was. All I had to do is I heard him order, and I, I said to my buddy, I said, don't turn around. Don't look now. That's Lon Simmons sitting right next to me. You couldn't miss his voice. 
He was just uh, magnificent. Yeah, I think I might have told you the story of running into him on that same Bay Farm Island at a Safeway. And uh-huh. he was sure. one of the few people that, because I've got moxie, I can talk to anybody. That doesn't really matter to me who you are. People put their pants on one leg at a time, that that sort of thing. And no one knows that more than me. And I'll talk to anybody. So I'm in line, and there's Lon Simmons standing there. And um, <laughs> because I could talk to anybody and go over to anybody, I went, <laughs> he says, oh, nice to meet you, too. You know, well, you're one of my favorite favorites. My, my voice went up. He was, I mean, just ever since I got out to California in 1965, I had the radio on listening to Lon and... It was just tremendous to, um, to oh, just Russ get, was, share his Russ face. Oh, Rodgers was still around, too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, another underrated guy, uh, because other than that call, the Bobby Thompson call, he didn't get the notoriety in the Bay Area for his announcing that uh, Hank got that uh, you know lawn uh, naturally yeah. um but he he died early too so um, mm-hmm. that, yeah hank greenwald was hank greenwald was another guy that was really good um and he came out of syracuse dry, university yeah and c- could just keep it light and not well he fits the san francisco style he, there's a style of broadcasting in San Francisco. I don't the, the the San Francisco people I don't I think don't like guys that are homers or, and guys that are shouting and shrieking. You know they, they like guys that are laid back and cool. Yeah, and they don't like homers, a nice word guys picture. like Brucao right. and Kite. They're not homers or anything, right? Right. No, they <laughs> they. Well, they are. No, they are. What? They I'm are sorry. in. It, they are homers. There's no question about that. But likable homers. Yeah, of what course. you're saying in a homer, they're not Harry Carey type, you know. Right. Um, right. Um, yeah, Bay Area has it. I'll tell you who is an underrated announcer who came up here from Southern California. He was a Dodger. Had a, it was Ron Fairley, and yes, I think, and he was I criticized. Think he was teamed, pardon me. He was with Hank Greenwald. Didn't he do it yes, with Hank he was Greenwald? With Hank. And he was he was criticized terribly by the press, and people didn't like him. I thought he was great because he told he had inside stories and told those stories beautifully on the radio. I think so too. And he had that Red Barber Southern drawl that um, yeah made and it very interesting to, and pleasant to to listen to. <clears throat> you forget that he was a Dodger after a while. Right. And, and I enjoyed he went, it, but he went, you're right. He got he got bad reviews. Another guy that got got very bad reviews here and went on to Miami and had has had a terrific announcing career. Or well, not Miami, Baltimore. And he was the he was the quarterback when O.J. Simpson played running back at. Sac City or San Francisco State or San Francisco City College, whatever. Yeah, I think he went to City. Yeah. Yeah. What? Who was the that quarterback? Who um, was it? Joe on? Angel. Yeah. Joe Angel, right? Ah, uh, yeah, I can always count on you when I get that those uh, temporary <laughs> glitches in my brain to bring us back. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry Feigelberg. I appreciate that. Well, Joe Angel is still working. All, who was your one-time favorite all-time announcer of anybody that ever announced? It's it's the legend himself, Vin Scully. I had the pleasure of listening to him for 13 years when I lived in Los Angeles. He was the master. No one liked him. Uh, um, he could tell a story. I might have directed you to this, and I might have directed our um, – our audience to this when the name Vince Scully comes up 
but there's a YouTube video with Vin Scully announcing the final inning of Sandy Koufax's perfect game. And yeah. as I look back, I listen to that a lot in awe, not only of Koufax's skill, but of Vin Scully's skill equally. It's like two masters. Um, which was a better accomplishment, the description of the accomplishment or the accomplishment itself? That's how good Vin Scully is uh. at that final inning. But he was great. And here's how big business and sports get screwed the fans. Do you know that in Vin's final year, last year or the year before, half of his audience never got to hear him because of a, um, a dispute between cable companies and the team or this, that, or the other thing. They were screwed out of hearing yeah. Vince Scully in his final year. That's disgraceful. Yeah. And Vin couldn't even, when he wasn't doing the games, you know, he stopped traveling cross country, and when the Dodgers were on the road, he couldn't get the games on TV himself because of that squabble. He lived in an area served by a different cable company that was going to be held hostage to uh, whoever whoever had the the rights. They weren't going to pay the money, and it's just tragic. And I think it's still, so he it's still be watch, going on. He, couldn't, he himself couldn't watch the game. Now, you brought up Vin Scully, and uh, he, he was, in the last couple of days, you know, uh, San Francisco, the, the 49ers' great uh, end uh, passed away. Dwight Clark. Uh, for, yeah, Dwight Clark passed away. And they showed the, the replay of the of the catch on TV and on YouTube. Vin Scully was the broadcaster that did that uh, call, made the call for on the catch. And he was his magnificent oh, self again. Yeah, if you get a chance, look it up. And remember that. I, I will. Absolutely. I'm still a little annoyed that they named that the catch. The catch should have been named the throw. The catch was Willie's catch in the 54 World Series, and that was uh -huh. the catch. Yeah, oh, yeah, 1954. Right. Yeah, yeah. And the greatness sure. of that was the wheel-around throw that Willie made holding Al Rosen at a scoring position and um, uh, really propelling the Giants to um, an upset. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for the fans for the fans that don't know, in 1954, the uh, Cleveland Indians set an American League record winning 111 games and losing 43. And they did, they, the Yankees won 103 and finished eight games out of first first place and the Giants were not and they were heavily favored to defeat the Giants and the Indians first baseman Vic Wirtz hit a ball about 485 feet which would have been a monster home run in any stadium in the ball in the country today but it was in the polo grounds and where center field went off went out to what 500 feet and Willie made that great catch and then threw it and, and wheeled and threw it was just unbelievable. And, of course, and the, the, uh, the, the Giants pitcher, went on to win all four straight. Yeah. The pitcher was a guy named Don Little. from Don Little, yeah. Uh, from Illinois. And Don Little gives, um, when he's taken out or he comes back in the dugout, he says to, to Leo DeRocher, the manager, he says, I got my man. <laughs> um, Don Little's name words, was in the paper. Words had creamed one. I mean, absolutely creamed it. And yeah. Willie says Willie's always said it wasn't his best catch by far, but it was his best throw. And yeah, Don Little's name was in the paper today, and and the reason for that is, as you know, one of the all-time greats passed away yesterday. That was uh, Albert Red Shandings. Hall of Fame yes. second baseman for the St. Louis Cardinals. Well, yes. Don Little was involved in the trade in 1955 or 56 where uh, 
Shane Deans was traded from the Cardinals to the Giants, and the Cardinals received Don Little in that in that package. Whoa. Whoa. So there's always something to connect in every baseball conversation with something else that is totally out of, out of whack, but the name comes up. Or yeah, it's unbelievable. Name. It is unbelievable. And, uh, and Shane Deans was only with the Cardinal or with the with the Giants for one year, and he got traded to the Braves, and he went to the World Series in 1957, and got another ring. So you never know how things are going to work out. And what what a career. and Rich uh, I don't know was was the second baseman on the last New York Giant. I love saying that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, New York Giant. Oh yeah, 1957, and he was the second baseman. On the um, the Braves the next year, when I think they had the as good as any team I've ever seen, and I go way oh, yeah. back on. And well, they had the Matthews and Aaron and Tory and the Adcock, yeah. Covington and Bruton and Del Crandall, and they, all they, those guys to go. They had Warren Spahn and. and I don't uh, know. Warren Spahn and Lou Burdett. Lou Burdett. Lou Burdett. So right, Lou. Won, yeah, he won three But I rooted three games. very hard for that team because the Giants had left New York. I was an, yeah. a National League guy. I couldn't root for the Yankees. And I yeah. really rooted for those, Bra- those Braves. Until and they came the through. Well, here's a little something about uh, Red Shandies. Uh As you know, uh, I was brought into baseball by uh, uh, Barry Weinberg, who was the trainer for the Oakland Athletics in 1993. Mm-hmm. And uh, ap- after the 1997 season, uh, Barry went to work for the St. Louis Cardinals. And, uh, you know, I had sold the store, and I was doing TV for, for Alameda TV. And I got a credential to go over to uh, see the Car- Cardinals play the uh, – play the Giants at the new ballpark. So I went over there, and I went down to see Barry. Barry took me over to spend some time with Tony Lusa, which I did. And then when I was down in the, went down to the Giants' dugout, who was down there? None other than Red Shandings. And Barry came over, introduced me to Red. Red was in his Cardinals uniform, wearing the stirrups and the socks like they did in the old days. Very gracious, and we, we chatted for a few seconds. I, I was off the charts thrilled. I can well imagine. Yeah. Uh, he was the oldest living Hall of Famer until he passed away right. days ago. Yeah, Bobby Doerr was the oldest, but he passed away about uh, in October of last year. Doerr was 99. Wow. Red was like 95. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Red was the last it's just member. Just no spring of chickens because we remember those days. I, oh, and yeah. the most unlikely guy after '58, Red develops tuberculosis. Yeah, and, I saw that. And um, he spends uh, maybe six months or a year in what they called in those days sanitariums. Right. Um, and. Um, he was totally isolated. He was uh, lost a part of his lung, if I if I recall. Yet yep. he comes back to play again, um, mm-hmm. and to live to be ninety ninety five years old. Yeah, just so, amazing. Um, absolutely, absolutely. He he is the epitome of what they call a baseball lifer. Absolutely correct. He he managed them, he coached yep. for them, he um, I think he managed them in, for them in '64. Oh no, in '60. No, no, it was Johnny Keenan. No, he took over in '66, and he, he won and a World brought, Series in '67. And they brought him back in '68. Um, right, right. When they won, did uh, they won the pennant? But they didn't win the World Series. The Tigers won in '68. Right. Yeah. You know, he, he was to the Cardinals what Johnny Pesky was to the Red Sox, a baseball lifer with one team, although they played for other teams. But they were, 
if you said, you know, who who is Mr. Red Sox, you'd have to say uh, for a lifetime was Johnny Pesky, and the same thing for Red Chains, Chains for the Cardinals. Okay. Although you may mention Musial. You may choose yeah. to mention Musial as well. Yeah. Um, and they were teammates for a long time. Well, and, and, they were and lifelong friends, too. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, you know, when uh, Yogi passed away, I always wondered how uh, guys like Whitey Ford, they're, they're really close friends. How, it's not the same after that. When you lose, um, mm-hmm. as we know, um, uh, big heaping uh, screw you mortality from the comfortably zoned radio network, <laughs> not just with <laughs> ball players, with family members, friends, um, it's uh, something that uh, I'll never, never get adjusted to. Anyway, oh. um, at least we got to honor those two guys. Sure. And well, you know, you, you bring up a good point because most of the players today will never, will never finish their career with one team. Some of them bounce around to two or three or four teams. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, after the. After their sixth year, and they can become a free agent. As a lot of guys get traded in their so they're with a team five and a half years. They get traded at the trading deadline, and then they go to another team in, in spring training. So they're and within one year they're on three teams, and unless they get a new contract from the new team, that doesn't often happen because you know the agent sold them out for the best deal. And they bounce around, and they'll get a two-year contract, be a free agent again, go to a fourth team, a fifth team. Some guys, like take, for example, our friend Bartolo Colon. He's pitched for nine or ten teams in his in his 20-year career. And that would that would never happen. You know, when they had the reserve clause, you were, you were a Yankee for life if you were very good. You know, Joe DiMaggio played his entire career. Mickey Mantle played his entire career. All the great Yankee greats played their entire career. Jeter is is probably the the only exception to the to the modern rule. Well, um, Jeter goes from uh, being a great player to being not the most competent executive. Going, I call <laughs> that the Peter principle. Sometimes you get a job because you're good at one thing that you do. You get another job. And you reach what they, what's known as your level of incompetence, whatever that is. And sadly, they bring someone in to replace you for the job that you were doing competently. And yep. he or she becomes the person who reaches a level of their incompetence. So both jobs are, are messed with. Um, and yep. that's the Peter Principle. So oh, yeah. you never yeah. had to go through because you have a good brain, young man. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, sure. Um, my girlfriend doesn't well, think so at times. Well, Do you? Um, Isla's sitting next to me. And, uh, and I don't, hopefully she doesn't have to listen, right? No, no, I got you're not on the speaker. So. No, no, I, that's what I mean. We're, we're not going to bore the poor woman. She doesn't that's know for sure. you. Right. Yeah, she, she's hey, doing thank something you for really your company, important. Thank you, Jerry. I enjoy it. This is A's Baseball, Past, Present, Future. We'll have Nancy back next week, Nancy Finley, our co hostess. And uh, I'm Ralph Tycho, the weak link at the Comfortably Zoned <laughs> Radio Network. Thank you, Jerry. Okay, it's been great. <laughs> Talk All to right. you later. Thanks for listening, everybody. Adios. Bye bye now. <laughs>